Mr. Minister, thank you. It's a powerful perspective and a reminder of the severity of the challenges we face and what's been done to address them. If I could, before we get into a couple more questions on defense policy, I wanted to ask you about your best effort to read the Russian mind and their long-term aspirations. Because as I hear your speech, on the one hand, you talk about spheres of influence. And sometimes that's interpreted as just Russia not wanting countries along its borders to be part of NATO. But you also talked about Russia essentially rejecting the 1920 <laughs> treaty that gave you independence and implying that maybe you shouldn't be independent after all. We know that Vladimir Putin has called the dissolution of the Soviet Union the greatest strategic catastrophe of the 20th century. That sort of implies he wants to put it back together. And we also know that he's claimed a right to defend Russian speakers wherever they may be. And 25% of your population, of course, roughly is Russian speaking. So do you think that Russia's main interest in the Baltics, including in Estonia, is to retake them in some way at some point? Or is it more about harassment, more about destabilization, uh, more about making NATO pay a price for having expanded, more about just making sure everyone knows that he's not happy with the current situation? I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. And of course, finally, there, there are a lot of motivations kind of melded together. So it's, it's, it, you cannot sort of bring out only, only one of them. Uh, for me, a lot of what Putin does has, uh, has its, its main roots in the internal policy of Russia. And I seriously believe that things might become even more complicated. As you have seen, President Putin has developed a very sophisticated but complicated system of leaving the presidency but staying in power. And uh, of course, uh, to be absolutely sure that this system works is very difficult. I mean, th th there are so many variables here. So the desire to mobilize the nation, to give space, political space, to transformation of power is something uh, which is, uh, I believe, a real risk. So uh, when I saw that Putin has suddenly thrown out uh, a list of uh, changes to the constitution, uh, I became uh, quite worried. Now let's see where it develops. There are different proposals uh, for the uh, constitution changes. Uh, uh, some of them are purely for pro power preservation, some of them are to change the nature of the Russian regime even more inward looking and even more uh, to, to, to have a, a kind of a closed society. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that this uh, transformation uh, time could lead to further uh, foreign adventures, military or otherwise. I actually interpret the present I call it Putin's war on history. I interpret the, the present war, of course, it's a, it's a great moment to utilize it because of the, the end of the 75th uh, anniversary uh, of the Great Patriotic War. Uh, it is, again, part of the internal political cons consolidation. But the fact is also that the Russian leadership, as it stands today, has not accepted, fundamentally has not accepted the, the results of the fall apart of the Soviet Union. I mean, exactly in what way would they want to remedy it very much depends on the situation. I mean, these are opportunist people, so, so they are looking for, for circumstances which might lead to, to, to new opportunities. Uh, an opportunity was grabbed with Ukraine, unfortunately. In a, in a very difficult moment for Ukraine, Russia attacked, and uh, it's, 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 it's a very sad example to, to all of us. So that's why I'm always saying that our biggest, uh, uh, our strongest uh, trump card is, uh, is uh, firmness, clarity, 
of our intense intentions, peaceful intentions. Uh, and the fact that NATO is in the Baltic states is kind of embodiment of that firmness, that clarity. Uh, it's, NATO's border is not a line in the sand. I don't think Putin believes in lines in the sand. Uh, it's a real border, it's a real protected um, territory, and uh, the, the NATO units in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania make it abundantly clear. All right, that's a great answer. Our colleague, Angela Stent, who's also a professor at Georgetown, you probably know her work, she says that Putin is often described as a great chess player, but he's actually better understood as a judo practitioner, not only in his sports, but in his geopolitics, because he looks for the opportunity, looks for the mistake, looks for the action of the adversary, and then reacts and tries to exploit. Sounds like you agree. I think, I think that's exactly to the point. So let me now move over towards defense policy, and it follows naturally from this question of Russian motives. And it really is going to be a question about how much is enough, or have we done enough to essentially protect NATO's eastern flank, and specifically the Baltics. You mentioned that we now have battalions, multinational battalions, in each of the three Baltic states, uh, led by the United Kingdom in your country, and then Canada, uh, and then Germany, and then finally the United States, with its presence of about 5,000 US personnel in Poland. So it's about 5,000 Americans in Poland, about 5,000 more NATO in the Baltic states, in what are, what's sort of a, you know, impressive combat capability, but also an, an amalgamation of companies and not even full battalions for the most part. And then, of course, the Baltic states are impressive, and I uh, appreciated your statistics on what your armed forces are capable of doing on short notice, but they're small. And 2% of GDP is impressive relative to the NATO standard, but it may not be seen as all that high relative to historical standards like the Cold War. So basically, have we done enough? Do you think that being clear in our intentions with this tripwire force, as you described it, is adequate? and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all reaching that 2% goal? Or do you think we need to think harder about the ability to really defend in a frontline way the Baltic states and then reinforce those positions quickly, uh, even more than NATO has done so far? So how much of this is a uh, sort of a, a signaling issue and we've therefore largely achieved our goals? And how much of it is a real defense planning question where we've got to have more capability and the ability to bring a lot more fast? Uh, as a defense minister, I have a whole list of things in my pocket uh, which I would like to get as soon as possible. Uh, when people speak about battalions, I would say better to have a brigade. Speak, people speak about brigades, I am shooting for a division. So uh, it, it's clear that uh, to have credible deterrence, we have to do more. Because I don't, I don't believe that Russians would take a purely symbolic deterrence, uh, seriously. Uh, we have the tripwire, but we don't have a clear answer to the question, what will happen if somebody trips on the tripwire? I mean, what, what are the next steps? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't have answers. What I'm saying is that NATO is lacking operationally capable mobile forces which could be quickly uh, deployed in, in, in necessary as, uh, um, as General Mattis, uh, Secretary Mattis called them, speed of relevance. Uh, so training the reinforcements, something which became a forgotten culture after the, uh, after the Cold War, uh, we have to remind ourselves how it was done and that's why I mentioned the U.S. exercise uh, Defender 2020. This is basically very similar to uh, the Cold War reforger exercises. Uh, the United States is bringing in April and May 25,000 men and women from the continental United States to Europe. Now, this is a big number. It's not a big number in Cold War terms, but in present terms, it's a big number. And of course, uh, uh, this exercise will be interlocking with exercises in different NATO countries, which sort of add their own manpower to the exercise. For instance, Estonia is doing its own biggest uh, military exercise uh, 
spring storm, so to say, together with the American exercise. Uh, so all in all, we are talking about roughly 40,000 men and women exercising in Europe. Uh, this, this, this is a considerable force, and I think it underlines the fact that it is not only the tripwire, but it is also our ability to quickly reinforce which builds a credible deterrent. Because the political deterrent carries you only so far. Mm. But uh, the opponent has to know that you have developed all the uh, nooks and crannies of, uh, of this challenge. Uh, and, and you actually have the capabilities to, to uh, reinforce your red line. So one more question along those lines, and then pretty soon I'll go to the audience. General Richard Sheriff, who, as you know, is Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, he retired from that position a few years ago and wrote a book, and we hosted him here for a book talk, and it's, you probably read it. It's called War with Russia, and it's a novel, but it's meant to uh, you know, assume the scenario that he took very seriously, that you take very seriously, a Russian attack on the Baltics. And he paints a very dire picture. Uh, of course, this was also several years ago when NATO hadn't made as much progress on burden sharing. But he also raised some doubts about whether the enhanced forward presence should continue to be these small pieces of individual national contribution, you know, a, again, a company here, a company there, or whether it should be a more integrated traditional combat brigade, or maybe even two brigades, that would, in addition to the reinforcement capability you're talking about, provide a tougher, more credible forward defense in place. Is that kind of a debate needed? Uh, do we also need a debate about whether the Baltics should maybe even envision 3 or 4% of their GDP going to their militaries? Or do you feel like if we get the reinforcement capability more clearly demonstrated through exercises and other preparations that that should be adequate? I think from the military point of view, General Sheriff is, is of course right. I, I wrote a study, I was then at an Estonian think tank called ICDS, and I, I wrote a study with him uh, which was called uh, closing the Baltic Gap, and uh, I saw some of those uh, ideas also in, uh, in, in, in his book. Uh, it is clear that from the purely military perspective, it would be wise to have combat brigades in place, uh, also because Russia has the ability to close the so-called A2 AD bubble and make it more difficult to bring in reinforcements. But I think we have to look at it also from the point of view of real politics. I mean, the, the likelihood that countries would come up with, uh, with brigades and station them to the Baltic states at the moment, in the, in the present circumstances, is quite, uh, quite small still. So I think we are at the moment making the best of what we have. Uh, in Estonia, uh, you have British battalion with one additional company. It's either French or Danes. So this makes it actually a, a, a battle-ready formation. Mm. Now, in other Baltic states, you have, I think in Latvia, there are 10 to 12 nations. Right. This is clearly more complicated and probably has a more political ring to it. But the fact, again, that so many nations participate, that there is an Italian flag, Sp uh, Spanish flag, uh, you know, all, all nations literally present, uh, is, of course, a very strong symbolic uh, point. Right, right, very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to now open it up. Please wait for a microphone, and once you get it, please identify yourself before asking your question. We'll start with the gentleman uh, near the back. Thank you very much. My name is David Nikuradze. I represent Georgian television station Formula in Washington, D.C. Recently, Georgia hit by massive cyber attack from Russia. Our international community condemned Russia's action, and Secretary Pompeo said that additional technical assistance will be offered for Georgia. I wonder if Alliance is going to strengthen cybersecurity in the region and uh, whether uh, candidate states will be uh, included. Thank you very much. I think 
the alliance, uh, NATO, NATO grappled a long time with, with this new threat of cyber warfare. I think we have now found a, a, a good solution whereby countries bring their national capabilities and allow NATO to, to coordinate, but do not give these assets to any type of joint unit or, or what have you. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's, it has certain similarity to nuclear sharing uh, policy of, of the alliance. So these are national capabilities. And uh, if partners have national capabilities, which they can provide, I'm sure NATO can use them as well or, or work them with certain caveats, limits, and, and framework, but, but work with them as well. Uh, I think that would, be, uh, that would be only natural. And of course, when it comes to the Georgian case, then I'm very happy that the last uh, cyber attack against Georgia was called out by the international community, including the United States, including Estonia. Uh, we have actually reached a moment whereby we can actually identify the perpetrators. The perpetrators of cyber attacks should know that this common understanding that cyber warfare, warfare is great because you can never identify the perpetrator, it's not true anymore. There are already forensic possibilities to pinpoint quite clearly who is there to be blamed. And we believe in Estonia that public blaming and shaming is the best way to deter these attacks. Uh, uh, naming the perpetrators, even if it's, uh, if it's a cyber attack, uh, which perhaps is not visible in any, any meaningful way. Very quick follow-up on that before we come to this gentleman. When you talk about naming and shaming being the best response, uh, I agree, but I also wonder how you would respond to somebody who says, you know, Vladimir Putin doesn't care if you name and shame him. He'll just tell a lie and say it wasn't him. But um, I think th I want to hear your answer. I think the answer is that because within the NATO alliance and the EU, we trust our own intelligence and it's pretty rock solid. Therefore, the kinds of sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are established and sustained, even when there's a lot of debate within NATO and with within the EU about how to treat Putin, how to react. But in, we have such strong consensus on Russian guilt that we are able to use these kinds of attacks as one of the reasons we then keep these sanctions so strong for so long. Is that how you look at it? I mean, how, why does name and shame work with someone like Vladimir Putin? I, I, th I think Putin often looks for, for degree of deniability. It's not only cyber attacks. It's, it's easy to say, I didn't do a cyber attack. I mean, the guy is saying, I have no troops in eastern Ukraine, or I haven't deployed uh, uh, INF forbidden uh, missiles, or, or et cetera, et cetera. I don't have Wagner in Africa. So, so he is going to deny <laughs> whatever you say. Uh, but, I, but I think uh, naming and shaming and, and uh, showing who has attacked is, it still has a certain preventive nature. It, it, it makes it more difficult to, uh, to blatantly violate the, the, the law, blatantly violate the, the sovereignty of other countries. Uh, an important example from Estonia is also that uh, when our air, airspace is violated by Russian planes, we always make it public. We always call in the Russian ambassador. We always pass on an official protest so that it's, it's not something they know that every time they do it, they have to go through this process of explaining that it wasn't them or it was just an accident. But anyway, it, it creates a kind of a, uh, not, not, a, not a very easy and comfortable situation to, to, to the violators. Thank you. Sir? Do we need a mic? Yes, it's coming right up. Uh, Mark Anderson, I'm an independent journalist. Um, kind of a two-part question. On the one hand, you said earlier, Mr. Speaker, that you, you expected or would prefer that Russia would drop its buffer zones. Is that correct? Did I hear you right? That it, 
that, that Russia should uh, get rid of or, or disband its buffer zones? Well, it's policy. Oh. It's policy. Yeah, it's a two-part question. I mean, wouldn't any nation be expected to maintain buffer zones because Russia is going to perceive NATO as the expansionist power block? It's almost like everything is in reverse. It depends on which end of the, of the telescope you're looking down. And in addition, Vladimir Putin is a lot of things, uh, rather untrustworthy in a lot of ways, but he's not stupid. What benefit would he get out of attacking the Baltics? I mean, the, the response, the retaliation would be overwhelming. He's a lot of things, but he's not stupid. So I just don't see Russia being that reckless. I'm just playing the devil's advocate. You know, wars have been started with very, by very smart men. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily a guarantee that only stupid people start wars. It will be evident usually later that it was extremely stupid to start a war. Uh, but often people don't get it uh, beforehand. I mean, it's, uh, starting a conflict is, uh, is often something which is to do with... Uh, let, 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 let me ask you, why did uh, Russia attack Ukraine? I mean, what's, I mean if, if I would have been a think tanker before the Ukrainian-Russian war, and I would have been sitting here, and I would have said, you know, at some point I envision Ukraine and Russia having war between themselves. I would have been considered crazy. I mean, I would have been kicked out of the think and, think tank community. Russia and Ukraine, I mean, two brotherly nations, one nation born out of the other nation, part of the common heritage. If, if, some, if some nations can be part of common heritage, then it's Russia and Ukraine. And still we have a war between them. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm always very careful when people say to me, uh, Putin will never attack you. Because people who say that, I, I apologize, but people who say that don't have means to uh, guarantee what they say. They might be right, but they might be wrong. And if they are wrong, they cannot help me. Uh, so, so that's why I prefer kind of uh, clarity and uh, preparedness. I mean, NATO battalions compared to the Russian uh, armies, tank armies, on the other side of the Estonian border. I mean, it's a very small military capability, really small. So it's not something where uh, we could say it's extremely provocative or... I, I am personally a great believer that uh, weakness is the most provocative way of, uh, of, uh, of provoking a conflict rather, rather than strength. Uh, and uh, I think we saw it in, in Ukraine, in, in Ukraine, the, mo the moment of weakness, uh, which was immediately utilized. So we must be strong. Before I go to Harlan for the next question, just to follow up on this myself, I wonder though, when you th and I realize this is not your immediate day-to-day uh, concern, but when you think about the long-term future of Ukraine and Georgia, of course, NATO has an open-door policy in effect. Since 2008, NATO has promised that someday we would try to bring Ukraine and Georgia in, but there's no interim security guarantee and there's no timetable. Vice President Pence, I think in 2017, went to Georgia and said, again, the pledge remains, the open-door policy remains, but of course, it's not something that's been acted upon. Is it realistic to keep that promise or that hope? Uh, and hope to implement it anytime soon, or is that maybe a, a concept that's better rethought? That maybe, not, not that Russia deserves a sphere of influence, but that putting yourself in Moscow's eyes and coming right into the, Soviet, the former Soviet space, into the heartland, into Ukraine and Georgia, would really be a bridge too far, even if it, it might have been you know, very smart and wonderful to have allies like the Baltic states join NATO. Ukraine and Georgia perhaps are just in a different category altogether. Is that a, a debate we should have as an alliance? I, I don't think so because all these debates inadvertently sort of support the Russian buffer zone near broad uh, policy. Uh, 
it's written in the books at the Bucharest summit that Ukraine and Georgia will be members of NATO, full stop. Now, even politically, you couldn't remove it from there. Uh, and uh, there are reasons to remove it. Might be that you cannot act on it today, but uh, as we have seen with the Baltic states, what is written somewhere might not be useful today, but it might be very useful tomorrow. Uh, for instance, the United States government recognized for 50 years Estonian ambassadors and consul generals in uh, uh, Washington. There were a lot of people in Washington who believed this wasn't a smart thing to do and it's totally irrelevant and why should we do stuff like that? Uh, after 50 years, suddenly, the guy who was our consul general for 50 years, uh, a fairly old, distinguished diplomat, Ernst Jackson, <coughs> became our first ambassador to Washington. So uh, I've always said to Ukrainians and Georgians, this line in the documents is inactive today, but tomorrow people will refer to it if they want to take you in. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not worthless. For me, the Bucharest document is, is an important uh, document. And uh, it's clear that it will, will, will not happen now, but I'm pretty sure it will, it will happen at, uh, at some point. Uh, Thank you. In the future. Thank you. Harlan. Um, I'm Harlan Ullman. Mr. Minister, thank you very much for your comments. I am just literally back from R Romania, where I've been working very closely with the Minister of Defense and the Chief of Defense on their strategic defense review. And two areas where I think that they've done some very interesting analysis. First is a forensic study of the brigade and battalion tactical groups that the Russians have mounted, particularly their strengths and weaknesses, as well as a very interesting analysis of the drone attacks against Saudi oil facilities last summer. And the results from those analysis reveal a number of systems that are not very, very expensive, but could relatively easily disrupt a potential Russian attack. I wonder if Estonia is using that same level of analysis to look at other systems that could be hugely disruptive, but are far less expensive than F-35 and M1 tanks. For a small country, it's unavoidable that you would use uh, the advantages uh, of, uh, of uh, your brains uh, against an overwhelming uh, armored force. And uh, it is indeed true that uh, a lot of things can be done uh, using the, the, the meager capabilities you have. A lot of weaknesses, the, the opposing side always has a lot of weaknesses. I think we shouldn't also mystify the Russian army. I mean, it has its problems, uh, it has a lot of problems. So uh, I, I think it's right to say that defending the Baltic states is not only a problem of force uh, counting, but it's an almost, I would say, an intellectual problem. Uh, and uh, so indeed, without going into to, to details, uh, uh, we, we are taking that into consideration. And sometimes, if your enemy goes high-tech, it helps you to go low-tech, because you have then uh, a lot of advantages which the high-tech uh, options do not uh, provide, as we have seen in our international operations elsewhere around the world, where an um, extremely low-tech opponent has been successful, essentially, against a very high-tech. Uh, um, international coalition. It's very memorable. It's almost like a Michelle Obama line. When they go high tech, we go low tech. I won't forget that one. Thank you. Uh, see if anybody else has some questions. We've got five more ministers. So we've got two in the back. Why don't we take them together and then see if uh, we can come back to the minister at that point. Sorry. 
Yana Slesarchuk, One Plus One Media Ukraine. Uh, my question is about uh, this uh, common problem in Ukraine and in Estonia. At some part of population which are tuned uh, into Russian media, Russian propaganda, and uh, Russian uh, Russia is counting on them as. Uh, uh, like s the field uh, in where all the all kinds of provocations can be done. So, uh, how do you see the possibilities to deter this danger? Like to work with it? Uh, how do you see uh, this problem uh, in Estonia and in Ukraine? Thank you. And then right behind, please. Hi, Mr. Minister. Thank you for being here. My name is Olivia Zhang, and I am a defense and foreign policy intern at the Cato Institute. So I have a question to you about the Trump administration pulling out of the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty. Uh, what, what's your opinion on the implications in the Russia and NATO relationship in the future? Do you think that the United States should deploy more Intermediate Nuclear Force Intermediate, uh, intermediate uh, nuclear weapons to the NATO allies in the future in order to con come back, in order to counter the Russian threats to the region? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, let, let me start with the, with the propaganda issue. I, I must say, and I might be surprising people here. I don't see it in Estonia as a major problem. Estonia is an EU country, relatively wealthy. The Russian community in Estonia is relatively integrated to the fabric of our society. So the likelihood that somebody can simply, with a fake news, or with some kind of a info operation, change their views about Estonia are very slim. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see a tool of doing that. And you know it better than I do, but in Ukraine, it's also not an ethnic conflict. So there are Russian speakers uh, 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 often on both sides of the of the administrative line. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. And in a surprising way, uh, Russians lately don't spend much money in, the, in their immediate neighborhood. I mean, they, they basically, they have two tools uh, for propaganda. One is the uh, Channel One, Russia Today, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, the Russian, uh, what is the, uh, Russia, RT, RT yeah. Russia 24, Russia 24 uh, which are meant mainly for internal consumption. And uh, Russians now have a problem how to move these channels also to 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 relate to the Russians living in the neighborhood, in other countries. But these channels are not meant for, for instance, Estonia. When a Russian in Estonia looks at the first Russian channel, he or she doesn't relate to it in a way that the person in Russia, who is in an information, closed information space, relates to it. Uh, when I was in, in Russia, as an ambassador during the uh, uh, Russian attack to Ukraine, then Russians didn't have any other tool, so they used Vremia, the Russian main news, every, every, every day, one hour from nine o'clock in Russia, it's the big newscast, Vremia. Uh, this was all about Ukraine. So when, when I looked at it, it was like a Ukrainian newscast a fake, fake Ukrainian newscast. Uh, they had to use it to, to exercise influence on Ukraine. They don't have good targeted, not, I'm, not that I'm sad, sad about it, but they don't have good targeted policies towards the, the, the neighborhood when it comes to propaganda. Because 
the neighborhood Russians don't trust the simple party lines. Uh, they have internal propaganda, and then they have RT, which is meant for you guys, uh, which is meant to deceive Western Europe, the United States. Now, you might say they are not necessarily very successful, but, but this is meant for the Western audience. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think we have found good ways to push back RT because I, I don't think we should consider them uh, uh, a proper news channel, but but rather tool uh, tool of the of the Russian of the Russian government. And uh, your question is about uh, question about the arms control. Well, uh, Russia violated the treaty. It deployed the weapon. It not only developed the weapon, uh, but it deployed the missile. So if one side violates the treaty, it, it is, for me, essentially totally pointless. I know that there are arms control enthusiasts who believe that whatever happens in real life, the arms control treaty is, is something good in itself. But uh, I'm not from that group. I'm not an arms control specialist. Well, so, so I believe that the, the treaty became moot. I think the enormously smart thing the United States did was to garner a consensus among NATO allies who supported, including all Western European countries, who supported the US decision to withdraw from that bilateral treaty because the treaty has a lot of relevance, of course, to countries like Germany and others. So, so that, that the, there was a unified understanding that one should withdraw, and there was a unified understanding why one should withdraw. Uh, I think this was, was of great, uh, great benefit. And uh, uh, if, if uh, somebody says that you know, NATO is, is brain dead, uh, NATO's political side is brain dead. Uh, I, I always bring this INF debate as an example, mm. that uh, you can actually use NATO for political purposes if you work and diligently consult with allies and, and try to achieve uh, consensus. Fantastic. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, I think we'll come here to the fourth row if we could, please. Mr. Minister, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm Emilia. I'm from Ukraine myself. Um, as you may know, on February 18th, there has been another massive uh, provocation created by Russian militants in the Luhansk region of Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, our, even our president has said that like, uh, this provocation uh, was caused to disrupt this peacemaking process because Putin wants to establish peace in his own way. And um, as you can see, Ukraine has been following um, all the international treaties we've been following the Normandy format to show our international partners that we are ready to create peace, we're ready to establish it, but without giving up the territory of Ukraine and our people. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could give any particular advice to um, what um, may be possible moves that Ukraine can, uh, can take to prevent Russian aggression or how to minimize um, any risks from Russia and uh, Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, there's probably no one, one, one good answer for it. I, I think uh, Ukraine has, has done a lot. lot and uh, uh, in the end, I think sanctions helped and uh, Western policy helped. But in the end, it was the Ukrainian army which stopped the, uh, the movement of uh, Russian forces. I, I think... Uh, People still remember the concept of New Russia or Nova Russia, which uh, Putin, uh, which Putin uh, spoke about when I was there as an ambassador. It was almost an official concept because the president spoke about it all the time. Uh, Nova Russia was, as you know, the idea was that it would go up to Dnepr, essentially halving the Ukraine. So we are we are. We are luckily very far from that. And 
the Ukrainian army did, uh, did a very good job in, in fighting that. I am also very supportive of President Zelensky's uh, approach to, to find a peaceful solution to the conflict. Uh, and uh, I'm, I really applaud his bravery. Uh, I know that it is not easy to do that. All kinds of find, finding peace is always very easy, uh, very very difficult, uh, not easy at all. Uh, and uh, but I, but I think it's unrealistic to shoot for a solution whereby all these problems will be suddenly solved. I am very skeptical of of the fact that. One day Putin arrives in his office and says, what the hell, let's go out of Ukraine, let's be friends, uh, all of us. Uh, I think the, the idea that we should step by step exchange prisoners, enlarge the, the line of neutrality between the two opposing uh, armored forces, etc., etc. We start with the small steps and perhaps at some point it will generate enough goodwill that we, we, we can manage to do something, uh, something bigger. But you are absolutely right. These uh, armed incursions, uh, of course, immediately destroy not only, not only the, 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 the logic of peace talks, but the whole atmosphere of peace talks. And uh, that's, that's really sad. Um, that's really sad. Mr. Minister, I've learned a lot. I admire your wisdom and thoughtfulness in discussing these issues. Very best of wishes going forward, and thank you for all you've done for NATO and for your country. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.